All right, it's live stream time. We're back. I'm trying to do two of these a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. I don't know, something about TikToking and teas. It seems to make sense. Um, so we'll see how that kind of schedule goes. Uh, and I really like this idea. I've basically put an Instagram story on Wednesday submitted for questions that I can then answer. So if you want to ask a question on one of these, Go look for my Instagram story uh, the day before, and then you can submit your question, and then I can kind of pick the best ones and work them up, and hopefully I have some watches that I can demonstrate things with too, because nobody just wants to see my face. It's better to look at cool watches. Okay, so we're gonna dig in today. Uh, I know, maybe I'll wait for a couple minutes for a few people to log on here. It is uh, 10 a.m. Pacific start, so hopefully, Everybody gets in here soon that's been waiting. But otherwise, these are live on my channel anyway, so you don't actually have to come in live unless you want to interact in some way. Uh, you know, you can always, always see it later. Uh, I'm getting an error here. What is this error? It's saying poor stream quality. Okay, well, hopefully that fixes itself. I'm gonna just keep going and we'll see what happens. All right, so first question here, I'm gonna start with the really easy ones. The first question was, what's my favorite langa? And this is really easy. I've already showed you guys a couple weeks ago my Pour Le Marit Tourbillon. This to me is the ultimate sort of, it's a perfect watch, it's historically significant, it's everything that you would want. It is and forever will be, I believe, the best longa. Uh, but uh, the the kind of more gettable one that I would say is the original Datagraph in platinum with a black dial. I don't know how many of you guys were around in the early 2000s, but there was this guy, Steve G, and he was sort of the first guy who figured out how to take really good photographs of watches. Um, and he had this wa uh, site uh, where he put these photographs. And the datagraph was the one that just like completely blew my mind. It was the first time I saw a movement that, um, you know, absolutely captivated me and was like, we, I, I have to own this watch just to look at this movement. Uh, and it's a beautiful watch. It, the proportions are great. The dial's amazing. The quality is just insane in person. Uh, it, uh, that to me is, is a great watch. It's not surprising that they've gone up some in value. You know, they used to be, it was a watch that forever I would buy at 35 grand. That was just like the number for a datagraph. People would email me all the time. Hey, I've got a datagraph. Okay, good. It's 35 grand. A little bit less if, uh, you know, if it was dinged up or something or no box or papers, a little bit more if it was maybe perfect, perfect. And uh, of course, if it had the, the really expensive longa deployant, it was a little bit more. But in general, it was like 35 and then sell it for 40 and do that kind of all day long. Uh, and now, I think for a while they went up to almost 80 or 90 last year when, when everything was totally crazy. And now it looks like maybe they're in the 60-ish range. I'm not sure, I haven't, I haven't owned one for a while. But even there, it's, it's a really great watch. And uh, it's one that I, I kind of wish that I had just kept a good one for myself because I would wear that watch a lot. Okay, that's my favorite longa. Next, easy question. A little bit less easy, actually. Somebody asked what my favorite font for a dial is, like, you know, Breguet numerals or whatever, whatever. And this is just totally not how I think about watches. You know, there's lots of different kinds of watches for different, uh, you know, different activities, different types of design, different, um, I don't know, tastes overall. And one watch may look good with one dial, whereas it doesn't for another. So I take a much more holistic approach. This is just kind of the way that I naturally am. I'm not one of these guys that's like able to really focus on details. And I admire that in other people. You know, there's people, uh, there's this guy, is his name Horo Mario? Or uh, I forget exactly what it is on Instagram something like that. And he takes these incredible, incredible macro shots. If you don't follow this guy, you should. Um, but in order to do that, you have to have such incredible attention to detail. And he's always finding, you know, like 
reflections of the undersides of hands or, uh, you know, these tiny little things. Also just uh, the ability to keep a photograph like that dust free and uh, everything necessary to pull it together. It, I, I really admire it, but I'm just totally not that guy. I'm the kind of guy who likes to be, uh, you know, get 95% uh, of the results for 80% of the effort and uh, in a photo or something like that. And I'm, I'm kind of like that with my taste as well. I just look at the overall thing and I see how it hits me and I go with my, my overall taste. Now that's not to say the details don't matter. You can, once you look at enough watches, you can tell the difference between, you know, really, really amazing finishing and just really good finishing without having to loop every little angle here and there and whatever. It adds to the overall impression. Uh, but to to be able to say like, oh, I like when a two swoops and loops in this sort of way and not this sort of way or whatever is just totally not me. Okay, next easy question. Urwork 100 or 103. For that, we gotta go to some watches and boom. 103, come on. Unquestionably, gotta go with the 103 here. Uh, it's, to me, I think still one of the most underrated independent watches that there is. Rarely do you get a combination of just a really cool object plus historical significance. And this is just the foundational model of the brand. Um, it's a great watch. It has, you know, Urwerk after the 103, sort of got much more uh, kind of aggressive and techy in their overall design. And this is uh, really an elegant watch for them. It has a very kind of vintagey feel to it, which I love. And it looks great on the wrist. It's really easy to wear. I think I've, I've said multiple times, women tend to love this watch for some reason. Um, my wife loves wearing these. So, and it looks good on kind of any size wrist. So you've got uh, the really early ones that I think are are becoming collector's pieces here, and then later ones that got really cool when they opened it up. This is the watch that that really sold me on the brand when I saw this. I, I fell in love and I had to have one. And in fact, it was my, I think my first independent watch, certainly my first like mega exotic independent watch was a uh, 103.03 .03 in rose gold. Um, but that, so yeah. For sure, 103 for me. Also the 100, I don't think it sits as well on my wrist. Yes, it's thin, but it's, uh, because of the thinness, it, it tends to look sort of flat and big on the wrist, whereas the curves tone this one down. So I'd go 103, you know, but personal preference. You can't go wrong, they're both great watches. Okay, now, the main one here, I like this idea of, of kind of taking a few easy, quick questions with quick answers, and then maybe one that takes a little bit more to unpack that we can focus on and be the big one. So you may have seen it as the title to this video. And it was a question about box and papers. Now, I get this question a lot. Do, do box and papers matter? Um, and the, the short answer is no. That would be my answer. But then the longer answer is sometimes they do. And, uh, you know, I think we can think about it in sort of several different ways. The, first of all, it's all speculation, obviously. The whole box and papers thing is about speculation. Whether the box and papers exist in your closet does nothing when the watch is on your wrist and you're out having a nice time and looking on the watch. And so it doesn't, it, it has nothing to do with really like the ownership and do you like the watch? Do you appreciate the watch? You know, that sort of a thing. So really all we're talking about is price. And in price, there's basically both the price that you pay and the price that it's worth at some point. Um, and so, so that's where it gets into this other area that's a little bit more gray because anytime you're talking about the price that you pay versus the price that it's worth later, you're introducing different variables. And the, and the main one there is that, you know, markets in general, in, in my experience, tend to work decently well. And if you have a thought that the market doesn't work, you need to have a good explanation maybe of why. So I'm gonna run you through why and when I think maybe the market doesn't work here. Now, overall, 
A watch with box and papers is worth more than a watch without it. Or better to say that without it, it's worth less. So you're gonna pay less for the watch. That, that's why I'm saying that markets have this stuff to some extent priced in. And the question is, how much is it priced in? Because ultimately we all know that it doesn't really matter. So uh, for example, if watches were free without box and papers and very expensive with box and papers, I think almost all of us would take them without. Um, and if they were the same price, all of us would prefer to have the box and papers because, you know, why not? So uh, that's where we're dealing here with a matter of scale. And I think that once we look at it that way, we can realize that there's certain circumstances that make it almost better to buy uh, without and certain circumstances that make it almost better to buy with. So um, basically, how do I put this? There's a couple different classes of watches and there's a couple different classes of watch collectors. I'm somebody who likes to wear my watches and I like to buy watches that I really like and like to wear, you know, as objects, as uh, design pieces, as whatever they are. And in general, if you're that kind of a person, then you're probably gonna be better off if you can, all else equal, buying a watch without box and papers if you can get a good discount. So what's a good example of that? Um, I've got this watch on today, and this is a watch that I have uh, currently listed for I think about 15 grand less than it just sold for at auction with box and papers uh, because mine doesn't have box and papers. Now, 15 grand is mind blowing amount of money for a piece of paper and a box that are gonna sit somewhere. And so the real question is, okay, when I go to sell this, if I do, if I'm never gonna sell it, I'm way, 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 way in the money saving the 15 grand, right? Why not? Spend that 15 grand on something else. You can get a great watch for that. Uh, if I am gonna sell it, the question is, is it gonna be worth more than 15 grand less when I go to sell it? Uh, and of course, then you, you even have like the time value of money and all those things. So if it's 10 years later and it's still only 15 grand difference, then you still were better off um, buying it without box and papers, right? So basically what we need to find are the, the watches or the types of watches where uh, either the market has overvalued the disparity between box and papers uh, or not, or where it's undervalued them. And, and kind of here's, here's how I think about that. Um, the, in my opinion, the best watches to kind of save money by not buying with box and papers are watches just like this, uh, this gyro, which are kind of very expensive watches. Ah, let's get a focus there, buddy. Come on, what happened to my focus? Ah, uh, yeah, let's give you a close up of that gyro. Sick. So, very expensive watches, but I don't really think that the gyro tourbillon is ever going to be one of these watches that, like, only the craziest collectors want. It's a watch that people love because it's a great object. It's a great watch. Um, but it's not some sort of like super rare, esoteric, historical piece. And that's where I would, I would basically draw the line. Um, so in this case, it's a watch that the main value of it is in how great of a watch it is and how beautiful it is. Ooh, that's beautiful. Um, versus uh, it being some sort of weird collector's something. So you're getting the value of the watch by having the watch. And if you can save 15 grand to have the watch, do it. I don't think it's gonna make a huge difference in the future. Um, that's just kind of how the market's priced it. And it's a considerable amount of money. Now, when you're talking maybe $20,000 watches or, you know, uh, again, this, this Urwork 103.09 uh, I have without the box and papers, um, because it's a cheaper watch to begin with, it's not that, um, it's not that different to buy one with boxer papers or without. So there it, it almost more depends like, okay, what's available? 
How much do you trust the dealer? I'd rather buy from a dealer that I trust without papers than from a dealer that I don't trust with papers. Um, and also, you know, for some people, $2,000 is worth more than it is to other people. So to me, $2,000 makes a difference. I'd love to save $2,000 if it's a watch that I'm just gonna wear anyway. Uh, but to some people, it's sort of a trivial amount and they wanna have all the kit with it, uh, kind of just in case, I guess. Uh, so. I, I understand that as well. Okay, here's another example. I'm trying to bring out watches for you. It's more fun to look at watches, right guys? So I'm trying to illustrate these points with watches. Um, so let's look at the difference between these two kind of heavy hitters here. All right, what do you think I brought? Guess. Okay, let's look. All right, two Big time, mind blowing, pff, like both grails, grail, grail, grail watches. But I still think there's a big difference here. And the difference is the GMT is sort of like the, the iconic Grubel 4C at this point. It's a beautiful watch. It's a great watch to wear. It's the watch that people think of if they if they aren't like insane watch people. It's probably, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, Grubel 4C, that's the brand with the big globe, right? They're talking about the GMT. So this to me is an incredible watch to own and an incredible watch to wear uh, versus something like the IP1, which is really about its historical importance, its rarity, it's, uh, it, maybe it, it could be said that it's a bit more of a sophisticated collector's piece. And there's a premium for stuff like that amongst, you know, the, the top, top, top collectors. They're gonna want this watch because it represents a bunch of, uh, you know, really important things about the brand and the time, um, and it's such an incredible object. But you have, you really have to be a very uh, sophisticated collector in order to understand this watch versus this watch, which I think almost anybody just on the street would look and say that this is probably, you know, the more expensive or the more desirable watch. It just kind of, it's, it's easier to get, right? Uh, get meaning understand, not not get, uh, but it's easier to, to get, get also, right? So that that's a really good example of where I think that in the future, something like the Invention Piece 1 may end up having a really big premium for having the box and papers because the people who are most likely to buy it are the super collectors who are wanting it for its uh, collectability, basically. That's one of the main reasons to want it. So in that case, they're gonna pay a premium for the fully complete, perfect, it's got everything version versus something like the GMT, where again, it has a little bit more mass appeal. It's a little bit uh, of a better thing to own if you just want something like to wear that's an awesome watch, uh, in which case, save some money, you know, it's a perfect example because it's a really expensive watch. So you may be able to save, this one has box and papers, but if it didn't, you know, you may be able to save 25 grand by not getting the stupid box and papers or something like that. That's a tremendous amount of money. You know, go buy your kid a, a, a car, buy yourself a car. Uh, my minivan doesn't cost that much more than 25 grand. So it's, uh, you know, I hope that makes sense where, you, you get kind of these arbitrage opportunities. And the main reason for that, I think, is that a lot of people think that their watches might become one of these crazy collectible things in the future. But the reality is very, 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 very few will. So these types of watches where the having the papers is exponentially better than not having them, I think is gonna end up being a very small percentage of the market. And it's really gonna be only the craziest, craziest collector stuff like this, and not even as much this sort of stuff. Now, one argument against that would be that vintage watches, if you look at them now, uh, having papers for almost all of them is uh, pretty significant. However, my argument uh, against that would be, uh, you know, I was a baseball card 
collector as a kid. And a lot of people thought baseball cards would be worth a lot because old baseball cards were worth a lot um, without taking into account the fact that everybody, you know, nobody knew that their 1951 Topps Mickey Mantle was going to be worth a house one day. So, so many of them were destroyed, thrown away, given away, whatever, because nobody really valued them. Whereas by the time I was a kid and collecting baseball cards, everybody had seen those older watches. And so they, everybody kept all their cards. So something really significant, like a 1989 Upper Deck Ken Griffey Jr. Rookie, which is such an amazing car. It's, it, you know, it's sort of the modern equivalent of that 51 Tops mantle for a lot of reasons. Um, but they're not that valuable because anybody who had one immediately knew this was a really special thing and put it right into a case and kept it. And so you can, you can really find them. It's a bit like a, a Schrodinger's cat situation. And we have that now in watches. Almost everybody who buys high-end watches knows that they should keep their box and papers if they want to get all the money out of them. And so if you look 30 years into the future at auctions, it's, I don't think you're going to see the kind of the same phenomenon that you see in vintage watches now. Um, so one more example of this, a really extreme example, just because, you know, it's fun to look at watches. Again, the Port Le Marit Langa. This is a watch where at this point, I think having papers on this watch could be worth like a hundred grand or more. And it's a perfect example of a watch that the main premium comes from super collectors. So Langa has since made more complicated watches. They've even made Port Le Marit variants with other complications and with other things uh, with much higher retails. And so as an object, they are sort of objectively better. But this was the original. It's sort of the perfect proportion one. It's the one that relaunched the brand. There's only 50 of them in platinum and they came out in the early 90s and they weren't always that expensive. I mean, they were always expensive for what they are, but it was in the 90s, it wasn't as common for people to keep the boxes and papers. So there's probably 50 of them made, you know, maybe there's 25 of them or something where uh, the box and papers are still intact, maybe even fewer. And the main buyer is going to be somebody who is looking for perfect condition box papers, whatever. So that's where you get these explosive premiums. But most watches aren't going to end up like this watch. It's sort of a very specific circumstances to get there. And so I think the best way that you can play the kind of box and papers game is to look for those arbitrage opportunities. This is a really expensive watch. It's a really cool watch. I love this watch. It's a great watch. It's a great watch to own. But is it going to be one that only collectors buy? And if the answer is not, if there's other reasons to buy it, and if the main reason to buy it is the uh, actual object itself, then perhaps the money that you can save by not getting the box and papers is worth it. Again, it's your call, but that's my overall thought of it. If it's something that I'm going to wear a lot and the kind of main value in it is the wearing of it and the owning of the object, then I'd prefer to buy a good example from a good dealer where I'm saving a bunch of money uh, by not having box and papers and I can go buy something else versus something like, you know, maybe these two where the a, a huge percentage of the value comes from the kind of collectors and museum and historical quality of it, in which case you, there may be a huge premium at some point for having the box and papers. And again, the that $100,000 premium for the PLM box and papers, that may have only been a $10,000 premium at some point, uh, you know, when it, when it wasn't considered such a historical piece. So that's where you can play your own thoughts about the future of the market and where things might go and and kind of deal with your own sensitivity on numbers. Okay, that is the definitive answer on the box and papers debate. Where you are on it and how much you're looking for these insane kind of collectors historical pieces in the future should be where you come down on this. But it's not just what you think, just you having the box and papers or liking a watch 
isn't going to make it so in the future. You have to kind of hone your taste and figure out and be honest with yourself. Is this really something that the main premium is going to be paid for by the most picky of collectors? And if so, get the box and papers. But if it's just a great watch and it's always going to be a great watch and watch lovers are going to want it no matter what, then maybe save the money if you can. Okay, I hope that made sense. That's my, my longer Q&A answer of the day. I've got some questions here in the chat, but I'm gonna get to those next time. I'm gonna try to keep these short and sweet. One main, couple quick ones, then one main bigger topic that I can expand on, and then get out of here. So anyway, glad you guys uh, came. I really like seeing these here. Uh, let, let me, well, let me just check in super quickly. Um, Ba, ba, ba. Can I wonder what ten thousand dollars over ten? Yeah, this is a good point. So I can't afford to spend thousands and thousands of dollars and settle for ten grand. I want exactly what I want. Just my perspective. Okay, so I understand that perspective, but it, to to my way of looking at things, it's really not taking into account. Um, the actual price differentials here. So obviously, again, if if all else were equal, everybody would want the box and papers. But the question you have to ask yourself is, why do I want the box and papers? What's the point? And how much am I paying for that? You know, if if for some reason you must, must, must have them and you would pay any amount of money for it, then there's nothing that I can say or do that will convince you otherwise. But I think most people, if they really drill down on that, will come up with some sort of version of the argument that I just laid out. All right, that's what we got. I'm gonna sign off for today. Have a great weekend, guys. I'm gonna be back next week. I'll try to do two more. Save up your questions. Please submit them to me on Instagram via uh, one of my questions, calls for uh, calls for questions for these. It helps me keep track of everything. Um, but th these are really fun. I hope you guys are enjoying them. Please subscribe. Uh, I think if you hit the notifications bell, it'll help you know when I'm going live because I haven't really figured out the best time and day of this thing yet. So hopefully that'll help. I don't really know the best way to get the word out. If you guys know or have suggestions, great. But otherwise, if you could help share it so that other people can find these things, uh, that would be fun. Otherwise, you know, I buy and sell and trade watches. So if you've got something to, uh, to sell me or to trade to me, something on my website that you like and you want to buy, please email me, steve at tiktoking.com. 